So we're going to shift gears a bit and talk about uh, Afrofuturism and the ways that the world created by fiction spill over into actual work for social change. And I've had the privilege already today to introduce our two guests to each other. They're both doing really compelling work and work that parallels each other, but you know, in very different spaces. So. So yeah, why don't you, since you were in rehearsal or each other introduced earlier, why don't you start on and tell us a little about who you are and what your journey has been like and what you're working on. Absolutely, it's such a delight and pleasure to be here. Um, I grew up in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, so a lot of my background and my world view really stemmed from there, and I moved to the U.S. when I was 13 with my family in Florida. The beginning of my life really was about asking these bigger questions about why is the world the way it is? Why is Haiti the current state politically, economically? So I went into international relations um, and with that in mind in terms of social change and social justice, um, I studied international relations at Florida State University, go Seminoles, um, and I went to pursue my master's in peace building and conflict transformation. And it was there really that I got involved with an organization called Coming to the Table. And this organization was founded by dissidents of the enslaved and enslavers. So black and white uh, individuals that were connected and linked through the same slave plantation. And they came together to really address like intergenerational trauma in the US. Um, and that experience led me to start a chapter at the university that I eventually became the youngest national president of that organization and really opened my mind in terms of the possibilities of using storytelling and narrative work to engage profound change in society. Um, but the journey didn't stop there. It, it all, it's only continued because I went to DC and I was working in the government at the time in 2016, in December, and it was before the sort of the political turmoil that had taken uh, storm. And I think it was really during that time that I started to really align my gifts, my vision, and my passion as a writer, as a science fiction and fantasy writer, to, to really understand how could we see writing as something that is more than the classical view of like sitting in a corner, writing by yourself. And why isn't that for writers today, especially prose writers everywhere, that writing isn't something collaborative, that it is something dialogic. So it was a start of Syllable. So I run a production house called Syllable and we bring science fiction and fantasy writers and visual artists from around the world to create imaginary fictional worlds. And they use those worlds in form of collectives to really, really push the edge in terms of their own imagination. Because I really like the work of Henry because he talks about the idea of the imagination and transmedia and world building because I, I really feel that world building as a tool is such a profound way of engaging our planet as a species because when you start to build worlds over and over, I've built thousands of worlds, and when you start to build worlds, you start to look at our current model of our planet, and you start to have the agency and say, this can change, this can be transformed. So a lot of the mission of Syllable Studios is really focusing on black and brown, underrepresented LGBT women, non-binary forces, to come together and create new worlds and hopefully those worlds can be 
the the next big franchises that can impact the world and and because for me as like for example this is a world that we brought together we partnered with the state department to form the one humanity writing collective so we brought writers women and non-binary writers from australia new zealand uh, puerto rico hawaii and alaska and they came together and they created a world called one humanity that's set in the deep futures and for over a year they met with different experts from academic backgrounds working in the field who presented to them their research around like the UN global agenda. And they wrote in that world to sort of apply speculative fiction and integrate to can we imagine new systems for our planet. Um, we've also worked with, we most recently we brought 10 science fiction and fantasy African writers. I highly recommend that you check them out. It's the Salty Collective. And they're making a storm right now because this world is a two star system, five planets, and it's based on a magical system around sound. And it engages a lot of African spirituality, philosophy, and thinking. Um, and all, really the vision here is how can we provide a space for creators, writers, and challenge this classical view that you don't have to work by yourself. And they can use that world to push their portfolio and push their imagination to see something new for our planet. All right, so Terry, you're joining us, thank you. Uh, so tell us about what you're up to. Hey, um, thank you, Henry, thank you, Fabrice, thank you, everybody, uh, for allowing me to speak to y'all. Um, my name is Terry Marshall, I'm the founder and executive creative director of Intelligent Mischief. Uh, we are a creative studio that works to unleash black imagination to shape the future, change the world. Um, things that we do, uh, we put in the categories of art, content, and production. And, uh, you know, first and foremost, we're world builders. Um, and we base everything we do using world building as a methodology for um, experience design and also like for social impact. Um, and stemming from, um, you know, I, I coined this term, um, imagination battles, uh, which oftentimes people might know from um, Adrienne Marie Brown's book, um, Emergent Strategies, where uh, she quotes me in it, uh, where, you know, where the term comes from is uh, understanding that the world we live in, the, you know, these old material things, starts in somebody's imagination, you know? And so systems that are designed and thought of that someone imagined this first, so we're living in somebody else's imagination if we are not the ones in control. So at the essence, a lot of times what we're having is imagination battles. We're fighting for the very, um, the, we're fighting for the very effort to uh, dream a different way or imagine a different way. So that that's like the basis of our work and what we do, right? We try to basically try to get people, help people, marginalized folks win the imagination battle. Um, some examples of of uh, things like that is uh, we did a project called, um, a multimedia project called Black Lives Survival Guide. Uh, we did that project, it was created immediately in the aftermath of um, Trayvon Martin's um, uh, murder being let off, uh, not, not guilty on trial. And um, what we came up with was uh, the, the climate, uh, which I think is, has been shifted somewhat since then. Uh, not saying problems haven't been solved, but is a different climate from people remember the early days of Trayvon being murdered. Um, that a lot of times in the media, it was still it was always the onus of a uh, of a black unarmed black person being murdered by vigilante and police. The onus seemed to be on the victim, and we we was like, how can we do something that could change the narrative around this, right? Because that, that was becoming a narrative battle, um, and very much the narrative was deadly. And if you listen to the arguments made in the trial. Uh, Trayvon is killed because of a narrative that's said about people in a black body, right? They mostly focus on Trayvon's body. No crime that he did, but like he just was suspicious, too suspicious looking. Um, and we said, this is ridiculous. Uh, we came with a term that was um, when things get, when reality becomes absurd, it's time to become surreal. And we made a multimedia project where we said they had to be a black body survival guide because obviously all these black people being killed uh, for no reason, somebody, the rules must have changed and nobody told them. So we need to actually help them learn the new rules. And we had, we crowdsourced these ridiculous tips 
of how the survival of black body in the racist world. And um, but when we started to do that book, we found ourselves we could not be satirical enough because all we were all black writing staff, and we found that we could not we could not separate ourselves from the the issue itself. My, I myself was almost shot by a police officer when I was uh, fifteen. Um, so these are experiences very real to us, and we stopped for a moment. A lot of us were like comic geeks, um, nerds uh, since childhood, and we said, "Well, let, there's a tool called world building, right? Let's use this tool, right?" And, and we took world building, and we took like, okay, the people who are writing this book, they have to be from a world where they're black people are free. They're so free to not deal with these problems, and we started to build this whole world. Where the, the the writers were these agents from uh, this nation called Nation X, which was a maroon society that still survived for the last five hundred years, um, that has been undetected and sending out agents throughout the world, the African diaspora, the free black folk. And one of the things they did was to write this book as a satirical tactic against the the empire. Um, and you know, we always tell people is think of Wakanda of the West. And um, and it was once we started doing that, we were able to write the book. And so we we went we went to character, and then we made a whole world bible of Nation X, where it became a separate project called Nation X, which um we did uh, two years ago. We did a, a online production of Nation X. That was the online world we created. We created a storyline about the Asians who are now DJs, who disguise themselves as DJs and throw these parties. It was an online party with DJs going on and. There was a storyline of how to connect to the portal of Nation X and what does it mean to free folks and what does that mean. And part two to that world will happen in at the LA Music Center in November. Uh, we'll throw a live party, live rave, 24 hours, um, and connect it online and in person. So these are worlds we'll continue to build on. Black Lives Matter Guy was a multimedia project. Nation X is becoming a live uh, storytelling project that we do uh, that have all these messages about black liberation, about um, you know, freedom and imagining and dreaming. Um, and we do this in conjunction with other projects as well. Um, we've created, recently created a podcast. We, we connect this to also like fans of the world building. So taking a world that's already existed, we created a podcast um, that's currently on Spotify, Apple, all the sites uh, called Searching for Wakanda, the um, Black Euphoria podcast, Searching for Wakanda. Uh, where we interview, we have a Keila Hughes uh, I was a YouTube star uh, interviewing various fans of Black Panther, Marvel, Disney's Black Panther movie, and who took their fandom and created social impact projects in the real world. So that was content we created, like what, this is what fan activists look like. This is continuing on world building, people taking their favorite world uh, building that's been a major movie production, and also how, could they, how does that apply to social good? Um, and I, I, don't, I don't know if we have a time limit, I'll stop there, I don't know about my two okay. minutes. <laughs> All right, well, both of you are doing really fascinating work. A lot of it is the nexus of what people are calling Afrofuturism. And students will, if you've done the reading for today, Scott for Catlin gets a little bit into Afrofuturism, but I'm wondering what that term means to each of you. So Terry, why don't you start us and then we'll go in the other direction. Um, Afrofuturism, no, I'll, I'll take directly. Um, I did bring some notes. Uh, <laughs> and I just want to um, quote uh, two two black women who are experts in Afrofuturism, um, and that's with Tasha Womack, who wrote the book Afrofuturism. Uh, her definition of it was is an intersection of imagination, technology, and a future, the future of liberation. Um, and there's another definition by Ingrid Lafleur, um, a way of imagining possible futures through a black cultural lens. Uh, I, I think both of those definitions really get at the heart of what Afrofuturism is. Is beyond. Uh, oftentimes, it's often described as a, um, you know, a way of imagining Black people in the future, right? That is science fiction. It's science fiction that just includes Black folk. But I think uh, Afrofuturism, onto itself, you can see that it's like it's no. It, there's philosophy involved. There's aesthetics. There's aesthetics philosophy. Um, it's a cultural movement that could span the spectrum. It could influence political thinking as well. But it, it's something that incorporates not just thinking about the future, including black folks, but also incorporates the history and, um, and cultural, uh, cultural uh, beginnings of like a black African diaspora that's mixed in with the future, which goes into like different African 
uh, philosophies as well. And that's that's a good way of, um, you know, tying the bow on it <laughs> with Afrofuturism in a nutshell. All right. And how would you define it? Yeah, I want to I want to do a shout out to Yatasha Womack. I would absolutely get her book. I mean, she's a good friend, and I, I appreciate the definition because in everything you're saying, because I really like what you said in terms of like, it's so funny that you mentioned the idea of the imagination battle because I, I didn't know that you were the person that coined that from uh, Adrian Murray Brown's Emerging Strategy, so this is absolutely amazing. I agree, I think that in terms of my understanding of Afrofuturism is that our imagination has been colonized. And I think the majority of the problems that we see on the planet today starts in our consciousness and starts in our imagination. And, and a lot of the times when you see a lot of the social movements that underrepresented folks, whether it's civil rights movement, whether it's the labor movement, any type of sort of activism that you see, it's really people imagining new possibilities and taking onto themselves the agency to change their conditions and change what's happening around their own community. So I personally feel Afrofuturism is really a language or a meaning structure that allows people of color, but not only people of color, but also everyone to really start to imagine the missing pieces and the fragmented consciousness that have been so locked out from a world of that's been based on white supremacy. So I think for me, Afrofuturism is something that has always sort of existed, but I think right now we're starting to sort of codify a framework around art, around film, around illustration, around music, and, and really give people the permission to imagine. Um, I remember um, Yatasha Womack posted something on Instagram and she was doing a workshop about the fut futurism and, and processes, and one of the kids she said, asked in her class, can, like, can you imagine a world without violence? And these were black kids that were really thinking about those processes. And that question for me left me, this was a couple weeks ago, and I was like, can I imagine a world without violence? What does that look like? Can we push ourselves to see that processes that have been put in place can facilitate those violence? And as we are world builders, can we affect that change in shifting what we are and what we can be? So I think Afrofuturism, we haven't seen what it can do, because I feel it's something that is gonna come, it's gonna be even more prominent. And we know that uh, films such as Black Panther um, and, and a lot of intellectual thought are growing out of this. So I think we haven't seen the, the grand capacity that it can do for society because I think we're just getting started as we're moving more towards a world where technology, we're talking before class, where technology is really challenging a lot of the traditions and the values that of so many different types of communities. And there isn't necessarily a big overarching mythology that exists on our planet anymore. So we're sort of entering a very nihilist space where people are seeking for truth. So I feel Afrofuturism can serve sort of as a language to bind different cultures, sort of a pan-Africanist, or even a sort of human civilization language of like, this is what we've done as a human species. How do we reconcile the intergenerational trauma of communities that have been marginalized? And how do we come together to really bridge that gap through sort of a futuristic lens? Um, so I think there's a lot of work to be done in Afrofuturism, and I feel like it's it's something for me, I'm, I'm still, understanding and learning to understand um, because it, it is such a powerful framework to sort of see the world in. So we've been talking about world building in, in this class mostly in terms of a design practice that results in these imaginary and fictional worlds, but you are both talking about it as a mode of analysis that can bring about social change. So tell us a little more about how that works and what kinds of projects you're working yeah, absolutely. I think for me, the way that I see world building and the way that world building is sort of conceived uh, and syllable is can we get groups of creatives 
And this is usually done outside of the Hollywood system. So I'm talking about like illustrators or prose writers. Um, and I moved to LA last year, last summer, um, to sort of connect and tie some of the work that we're doing at Syllable. But we use world building as a way to get creators to own their content and own their IP and start to imagine the world together. So we held our first pins down, which is one of the production cycle at Syllable, and a world called Paralimbia. It's a world set in a deep future where the US has faced extreme climactic challenges where everyone has become homeless. And you have the earthbound people who are really have a different vision of the future in terms of connecting more to the planet. And then you have the silicons who are sort of the antagonists and their vision of the world is sort of the metaverse. And they go out and digitize physical bodies and people literally perish when your mind is digitized into this digital society. And they do that to plants, they do that to earth. So it's, it's almost as if it's like, how do we use world building as a playground for creators to start to imagine the future that they want, but also wrestle with these profound issues that are facing our planet. Um, because I think that we are at an impasse as a society, uh, that we are facing titanic issues, like for example, the heat wave that happened in LA, and I'm sure everyone in here enjoyed it a lot, and it was, this was record-breaking heat waves in California and drought. I think these are serious and profound issues, and the current models of our society doesn't seem to react fast enough to do it. So I, I personally use syllable not as a way, not only as a way to kind of give agency to creators to imagine and put out their work and get those work adapted to different forms, but also to imagine a better society and to sort of wrestle with some of the, the challenges that our planet is facing. Terry, how do you think about world building and social change? Um, uh, very similarly to, to Reese and Emma. <laughs> that we do. I can't believe we're just meeting today. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, uh, you know, give a give an example of that shows like how we use it. We very much so that it is more than just a writing tool. It's literally how I said the foundations of uh, it helps make your imagination come come to life, come real, right? With whatever, um, you know, all social movements also begin with imagination, right? And and telling then telling that story of the world you imagine to others to bring them together in order to make that to make that imagination imaginary world real. And that's what you're doing when you protest or when you vote or you lobby, right? You're you're doing this based off a story that you're telling yourself and telling others that we, the world as it is now, can be different. And world building is like a, a very efficient tool that we craft that world and then use it to become real. Um, case in point, we just did a project. We just created an experience in Memphis, Tennessee, about a month ago now, uh, called uh, Archipelago: The Sonic Experience. Um, we were giving, um, we received funds to create a narrative uh, project that would uh, create, help uh, create uh, a positive um, pro-immigration uh, narrative uh, to combat the anti, some, some anti-immigrant uh, narratives that are prominent out there in the world, in the media sphere. Um, what we wanted to do was create a series of experiences for folks who could just take this story, take this narrative, and embody it in their bodies, right? It's what we call like having, how can we develop enough transformative experiences uh, for people to then act and change their behavior or act on um, wanting to um, bring about the change they seek. Um, what we settled on, and we particularly did this in around the issue dealing with, taking the issue of immigration and dealing with African-American folks and uh, black migrants. And what we had came up with was uh, understanding, going back to the philosophy of Pan-Africanism, um, and very bluntly going back to you know uh, old adage was um, you know uh, all, the, all the black the black diaspora. Um, the only difference between us is uh, what stop you got off at the what stop you got off the boat, right? Uh, during slavery. <laughs> Other than that, like we're a very creolized uh, folk. Um, so the, one of the major issues around immigration 
um, and having people be having empathy in the United States towards immigrants is um, not, it's seeing immigrants as the other. And so we have to understand if we want to have a borderless world or, you know, this is our imagination, our dream, a borderless world, a world where there's one humanity, we can't see each other as the other. We have to see each other as like, we're one, we, we are together even with differences and want to help one another. Um, what we came with that was then understanding through uh, sonic experiences and through African diaspora music uh, was an easy way to show that, hey, we are one even with differences. And so we do a, a three-day experience in Memphis, Tennessee uh, called uh, Archipelago. Um, we, the first night was a sound clash coach party where we had live streamed. Uh, we had a live performance and people for uh, DJs from Memphis called Body Work and who battled um, DJs who were live streaming, uh, African descended DJs who were live streaming from Australia, Ghana, Jamaica, Brazil, and London all at once. Before you got to that party, you had to enter through a tunnel where you came through a emerald African forest, uh, which we had made astroturf and hammocks and tree, tree branches. We totally transformed the space into this um, Afrofuturist African forest. We had wall projections, we had an African marketplace, we had video uh, installations going on. And so the first night of the party in the next three days was um, uh, just you could come out, hang out, experience. We had a pop-up uh, black women bookstore. And so now we got invitations to do, create this pop-up in Brazil, in Oakland, in New Orleans, and we're hoping to carry it all around the world. But we also created a manifesto, uh, which we had live recordings of people going on. The manifesto it has the messages of um, pan-Africanism and a pro-immigration uh, stance. And so as part of our experiment of seeing this whole world we created, um, we, we did an eight week, I'm sorry, it's probably the biggest part. <laughs> we did an eight week design session with folks, different experts of designing, crafting this new Pan-African dream, right? And where we did world building and we looked at the history, African diaspora history, but also like what is the future of that? It was the future world. And the future world was displayed through um, uh, archipelago, right? This is a world where borderlessness was uh, seamless because you're just listening to music, you're interacting with people simultaneously, the technology is helping you do that. People are experiencing that. So then the next time someone says, hey, you may come to this party and have that experience and someone told you like, yo, um, forget these people from this other place. You'd be like, why? I enjoyed this. I had conversations with other people, you know? So we want, how can we embody that? And all that stems from the world building that we did in the eight week process building up to that. Fantastic. Okay, students, question. I'm sure something has provoked you already. Um, yeah, Deborah. The borderless world is, um, is a, a dream or a thought that I've had for a very, very long time. And being uh, citizens of this planet and being earthlings first and foremost. And um, I just wonder uh, how you're going to take this around the world and whether you're gonna do it in different languages, whether you're going to be sensitive to the cultures where you go and uh, make it local in some way, because, um, because wherever you are, you are local, right? So if you bring it somewhere else, is it gonna be local somewhere else and speak in the language of where you go? Or are you gonna bring, uh, is it gonna be in English, you know? Is it site specific? Because I love this idea. Is the, the question is to me. Yeah, thanks so, Jerry. Okay, <laughs> yeah, I just missed the first part. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you for asking the question. Um, yeah, so we do a lot of work to make it local. So, you know, I, I actually should have uh, emailed Henry and them a uh, short video we did. But um, we work with folks on the ground in Memphis, Tennessee. We picked Memphis, Tennessee because the history is the birthplace of rock and roll, uh, very closely related to the birthplace of blues. This is all, all music from the African diaspora. Um, Memphis, in, in, Memphis in and of itself, if people haven't been there, uh, you know, is named after a city in Egypt. And they, um, they have a, there's a lot of local things that even connect them 
to Egypt and Africa, people have a lot of like a deep um, questions about that there as well as we learned hanging out in the city. Um, you know, we, we worked with local DJs, we worked with producers on the ground. Uh, even the, we created merch that came out of the project where we used um, uh, the Memphis, what people call the Memphis Blue. If you see any sports teams or college teams or any of the cultural things come out of Memphis, it's a particular blue color that comes out. We made this women Memphis Blue. So there, there's a lot of stuff we take to the care to, um, as we do the project to incorporate a very specific, uh, site-specific um, cultural, uh, cultural uh, norms about that. Uh, we're hoping to do that wherever wherever we take the project, and but also um, that 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 being a key part of the project is also a key part, particularly this project. I don't want to get lost that the project is um, an African diaspora uh, project, and with the understanding of uh, there's a common thread throughout the African diaspora culturally and lineage wise that um, as we take care to the local, we are also take care to like how that connects to different languages and. Um, cultures and understanding that still are still contained within one. Now you can apply that to a larger uh, Earth society as well, right? That, that's that's the thing we we also want to make part. Like we're all part of humanity, um, but understanding our own blackness is understanding how we're part of humanity and growing from there. Um, but definitely, like yeah, we definitely incorporate those things as the project moves along. So I should point out that in some of the work we've been doing. Uh, my project on civic imagination, we go and do world building workshops of all different kinds of people all over the world about designing the futures together. And the idea of a borderless world keeps cropping up. One of the things that crops up very often is a teleportation system in Star Trek. So this is why I'm sharing the story in this context, right? So for the Americans, when we've done it, a lot of groups have come up with the idea of teleportation as a way of combating reducing carbon footprint, right? Who knows whether it causes more or less environmental disruption, but people want to use it to imagine modes of transportation that are less disruptive. Uh, when we did it in Europe, it was about efficiency. That is, couldn't we substitute a system of getting between European capitals in the EU that doesn't require changing trains three times in Brussels or something, right? Uh, when we did it in in uh, Beirut with Arab leaders from 10 countries, they talked about safety. So how do you get Syrians to Germany without drowning along the way? Uh, when we did it with immigration rights groups, they point out that by definition, Kurt Spock and McCoy exist in a world that is without borders because no one comes down, there are no walls that block them from teleporting no one comes up to them when they teleport down and says, where's your green card, right? They, they exist in a world where there cannot be a policing of borders by its very nature. And recently we did one in West Virginia where people had one of the traumas they talked about was a sense of being flyover territory and their children move away and didn't choose to come back for the holidays because it was so difficult to get there. So the idea of teleporting your children in for Christmas or Hanukkah in the mountain regions of Appalachia had enormous power when these people talked about it. So it gives a metaphor for thinking about all of the deeper concerns that people are struggling with, not just around transportation, but around their entire way of life. So the, using science fiction as a metaphorical tool to think through these issues is a really powerful thing to do. And Star, I, I'm so thankful that Trek has given people this resource for thinking about um, the world in these different ways. Henry, I, uh, you made me think of um, the stars of my destination mm. and jaunting. I don't know if your students have come across the stars of my destination. Highline, right? Uh, yes, and uh, uh, actually it's Alfred Bester. Oh, yes, you're right, you're right. And, and Jaunting, where I had, not, I had not even thought about that book in a long time. I know, so I don't want to take the conversation to another place, but do you want to jump in yeah. on yeah. some of this? Yeah, I had a few oh. thoughts as well. I think a border of this world is such a powerful like process, and, and I feel like as a planet, we're moving towards a world society, 
and I do know some of the projects of globalization has the, the initial like sort of endeavor around globalization. I think we've seen a lot of failures in that sense. So I think the challenge of tomorrow is going to be how do we universalize a vision for humanity without sort of erasing the particularity and authenticity of the, those individuals. And I, and I particularly have seen at Syllable or even within me sort of a profound shift or sort of a unification of values of our site when you sort of create worlds. I think that identity as a world builder or even what Henry is hinting at and also Terry is that it's like I think when you, you're in the act of creating meaning, you start to see beyond the previous imagination or the previous template of what you're sort of surrounded at. So I do feel like if there's a way to allow people to be immersed in more, and that's why I feel like Hollywood has so much, has so much power in terms of like value transmission around the world. It's like when I was growing up in Haiti, like a lot of the films that I saw defined for me sort of the vision of the planet. So I feel like there is a responsibility for diversity. There's a responsibility for building worlds that allow people to be immersed and sort of gain a new vision that can hopefully lead to this sort of borderless world that we would hope um, would <laughs> lead us to less violence. But I, I totally agree. I think I do feel like the idea of a world builder itself per provides a really an inner sort of revolution of values and it allows you to see beyond sort of the the sort of uh, the way the world has been designed I mean and it's very it gives us a lot of agents so at least I've, I've seen that more okay so there's a hand over there back in the back yes in the back corner thank you we'll get a mic to you in just a sec for coming. Uh, I've noticed, I think, with a lot of um, imaginary worlds that are envisioning the future, we see like a lot of pessimism, especially with like climate, uh, cli-fi or whatever, climate change, science fiction, and those visions. And I feel like that's not something you maybe see as much in Afrofuturism. So I'm wondering, is, is optimism kind of intrinsic to Afrofuturism, or is there a place for pessimism, or would that be kind of counterproductive? Yeah. <laughs> Terry, if you want to take that. <laughs> I'm so I'm glad for you. I'd love to hear you. <laughs> um, uh, I'll say, I'll just jump in. I was like, I was waiting for you to say first, but um, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I, I would say. I would say, yeah, that optimism is uh, is a key part of Afrofuturism, or it, it tends to be. Um, it, and I think, um, eh, man, bluntly, like uh, I, I, <laughs> black life, <laughs> black life is um, can be very pessimistic <laughs> in of itself. Uh, that I think the tool of Afrofuturism is to show the, pos the possibilities. Um, what is the horizons? I think the dominant narrative surrounding people of African descent is um, is just is bleak, um, and Af Afrofuturism is a tool that's to share like the vibrancy and richness of Black futures and what can be, what's the alternative, what's possible uh, in the midst of this bleakness. Um, if we go back, you know, Robert D. G. Kelly, who wrote Freedom Dreams, uh, who's an excellent scholar, um, talks about. You know, it's the Afrofuturism is anything new, just look at maroonage. Um, and we talk about the maroons, the um, escape, escape, this former enslaved Africans who were managed to escape throughout the Western Hemisphere and create societies. Um, you know, that was them escaping their, their world and creating these whole alternative, like really complex, um, complex um, societies and infrastructures. Uh, I think it's often thought of that there's only like five people in a forest who are like barely surviving and there's like whole entire like um, uh, so, uh, government systems that was developed in these maroon societies and the most successful maroon societies stand in Haiti, uh, the most successful first black uh, revolution in the world of our uh, former slaves. Um, 
you know, that people have competencies, but it has to be, if your whole entire body is, is enslaved, it has to only take imagination that this was possible, especially when you're becoming like generations of people going down. Um, there is, there is a, a political philosophy called Afro-pessimism, um, which is out there. So, you know, it's not, uh, it's not just that every black person just thinks happy thoughts all the time. Um, it's, it's, so you, you go, you could go and research that, but I, I'm much more in the field of uh, Afrofuturism and, and the, the futures that brings, and also, um, you know, hope to link that to solar punk and other uh, such genres. Yeah, yeah, thank you for, I'll add a few thoughts as well. I think, thank you, Derek, for that in that question, because I, I really feel that, for example, for me, coming from Haiti to the U.S., like, we grew up knowing that we were the first black country and that slaves overthrew the French empire and all the empires defined the, a nation where the moment the Saline said, the moment any anyone around the world that is freeing oppression lands in Haiti, they would be automatically free. Um, I'm a columnist for the Haiti Observateur and I have a column titled Haitian Futurism to sort of explore how do we take the imagination of sort of the Haitian culture forth in the future. And I agree a lot with what you're saying, Terry, because when I moved here, I sort of realized that it just seems that because of slavery, a lot of African-American history has been erased. Um, and it's like you grew up as a black person in America and they tell you that you don't have a past until that first slave ship came to America. And then the beginning, the inception of your identity is trauma. And then, yes, you were at the, yes, thanks to the African American Museum of History and Culture in DC, which I highly recommend anyone who's ever, who ever travels to DC to attend, you see the power and magic and the beauty that African American stories and imagination has sort of created in the foundation of this world. But so many people don't have access to that form of imagination. What they see on TV is just, a police shooting a young black black kid. Or you see someone cursing and or the racism that people face. So I think Afrofuturism by necessity requires a profound optimism. And it requires an engagement with the future where you have to sort of put yourself in an uncomfortable space to create new meaning structures that the education system's not gonna give you, um, or growing up on the on in the culture or even some might even claim or sort of filmography. And it's like, that's why I think Afrofuturism as a cult, as a movement is really sort of allowing the sort of fragmented imagination of people that have been pushed out in the margin, who have been creating, who have been imagining to kind of bring it to the mainstream. So a young person can see that they can be this character in this film, or they can be this character in the future. Um, because I know you hear that all the time. It's like growing up, I, I wasn't, a lot of the sort of the space um, TV series, I wasn't necessarily a, a, a passenger in the spaceship. I was an observer because I didn't see people that look like me. But I feel like Afrofuturism is, is almost remedying that where people see representation on the screen. They see, those sort of ideals where they can stand fully and say, I'm a human being. And, and, and there's more beyond the sort of the trauma that began my sort of racial past. Any other questions out there? Yes, down there. Hi, um, you mentioned like, uh, specifically like fandom efforts and like that translating to activism. So I'm just curious like what those exactly are and like how um, how like fandom and world building translates into real world activism in your experience. You wanna? Um, yeah. Go no, ahead, no, no, go ahead. Go. No, go ahead, Jerry. I was gonna, <laughs> I was trying to see what you, you were gonna jump in first. <laughs> um, I'll say real quick, uh, just um, shouting out some of the, the guests that we had on the uh, Search for Wakanda podcast. Um, 
so impressed uh, Jaya, Jaya Thomas, uh, who created a project called, oh man, it's forgiving me, <laughs> uh, things like Diversity Initiative, um, getting that wrong, it's Diversity, so it was Diversity Initiative, Jaya Thomas. Uh, she was a guest on the podcast, and she saw the first Black Panther movie, and she actually was so energized by this all-black cast, and um, you know, this movie generating so much money and so forth. And, but she wanted to find out who was representing all these people. And when she found, she looked deeper, had noticed that um, you know a lot of the people's agents or a lot of people doing behind the work were were white, and that this is still like a you know diversity still being an issue in the industry. And she she created a project to um, actually create more diversity behind the scenes of the camera, but it was inspired by seeing Black Panther, the movie. Um, there's uh, some other folks who've created the, the Hidden Genius Project, which is about uh, teaching coding to young black children. Um, Shuri, uh, Shuri is the smartest person in the MCU, um, in the Marvel Universe. Uh, her being made a prominent character and people seeing like a young black woman who's like a scientist and do all these things, many people started creating all these like different projects around that was um, including that uh, bringing the step science and um, science and arts to more more um, underprivileged black children in the city. Um, there's yeah, there was a there's, there's a number of other people where there's about I, you know I'm just gonna plug the podcast. There's like six episodes. <laughs> you know people who've um, done all this, but even beyond that, um, and Harry, uh, Henry could probably tell you more about this. There's um. Beyond Black Panther, there's probably the most, one of the famous examples of fan activism is the Harry Potter Alliance, which I think they've changed their name to Fan Forward. Uh, yeah, fan Forward. I'm going to speak about that in the next lecture segment once we're done with this. So more fan <laughs> activism to come. And, uh, yeah, yeah I, I, totally, I, think, I think that's the sort of future of, of engaging our society because I think what content or storytelling our worlds do and creating fandom it's like you're pushing culture you're sort of creating a, a, a set of values a set of behavior a set of thinking and you're immersing different people from different cross of life together in this shared mythology and i think i didn't necessarily have the language for that until henry presented to the one humanity writing collective i believe last year or was it this year i, I, was, I lost track <laughs> it was like, but it was a great, great event. Yeah, he, 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 extremely compelling in terms of fandom and how fandom sort of moved people into action. And, and I, I think it solidified for me my conviction that films and storytelling are so incredibly powerful. Like you go to Comic Con, you go to these events, it's like, you, like the fact that I've watched, let's say, Star Wars and another person has watched Star Wars, that brings us closer together as people and because it brings us closer together as people we're able to sort of have a language for communicating and affecting change i think there's other example that henry will probably go over in terms of like more direct action and community change but i feel like there's the idea of shared mythologies that are fandoms is i think has has made the world a better place um because you get to meet people who are might be from a radically different culture, but because you just consume the same music or the same film, and you're a fan of the same thing, you are closer to them. And by that fact, I think in terms of community and agency and change, it makes a democracy thrive. Well, thank you so much, both of you, for joining us. Uh, we're gonna take a 10 minute break so you can do your bio break. When we come back, I'm going to do talk about fan activism, civic imagination, and, and a, a little bit of superhero. So, uh, and then we will see what what we can from uh, Zoom tonight. So, thanks, thanks all. Take your break. Thanks. Oh, too late. Okay. <laughs>
always like you always like buy that. Like your NASA jacket, that's like you smart. No, that was the third one. I don't know the first. Yeah. Sorry.